So in this section, essentially what we're doing is we're providing a glossary. So you can use this section throughout the course to come back to it if there are things you don't understand. So when we go back to mapping, when we are using functions and we are playing with the scope of variables, state variables, local variables, it's okay if you don't know what any of this means yet. I'm just letting you know that this section upcoming here is for that. It's a glossary that you can use so when things get a little bit advanced, they get a little bit hectic, or when they're more basic, but you still don't understand or you forgot what something is, you come back to this section and you check out the videos. That's what it's intended for. Now you could go through it right now if you're just curious. You may not have all the context yet. You probably won't have the context yet, so some of it may be like, all right, well, that's what he just said, but I can't actually practice this myself, or I haven't actually seen that many examples. We, I do try to provide some examples in each video lesson in this course, but it's not the same as doing it in the other videos in this course because we're going to see all of these things come up so many times, and the best way to learn, in my opinion, is to do it yourself. Always do it yourself. You are a self-learner anyway. I mean, that's why you're here, right? And you're good at that, or you're learning and developing those skills. So yeah, so that's the heads up on this section. That's what you need to know, what it does, what it is. Hopefully that's nice and clear. And uh, yeah, hope you're enjoying everything and all the best. Good luck. I'll see you in the next video. So the address in Solidity is a variable type that holds up to 20 bytes. It holds That holds the 20 byte value which represents the size of an Ethereum address. So if I open my MetaMask, we see that I have an account set up, okay? And if I copy this account to the clipboard, and let's say I, and let's say I just paste it into this search, we see this address. And so when we declare something to be an address in Solidity, we are essentially setting the variable to be an Ethereum, to be an Ethereum address, to be an address. And it's as simple as that. So in order to define an address, what we would do is we would just say name, which would be a string, and we could set it as an address. So what we would do in Solidity is we would say wallet, right? Let's say we were creating a wallet and we would say address to set it as an address. And then if we wanted to create a list of many addresses, we could actually create it to be an empty array like this. If we want it to be payable, we can say address payable wallet, okay? And like this, we are defining our wallet to hold addresses. In this case, we would probably wanna say wallets, plural, since we are using an array. Okay, mapping. So mapping is something that we're going to be using quite often in our contracts. So mapping essentially holds the reference to a value, as it says here. So below we see an example of mapping, and it creates essentially hash tables, which consists of key types corresponding to value type pairs. So it's a store that does key to value type pairing. All right, and if that doesn't, all right, all right, and if that doesn't make sense yet, don't worry we're gonna be mapping quite often, so you're gonna get the hang of it. But if we look at the example they have here, what we do, what they're doing essentially is they create mapping by declaring mapping. And what are they mapping? Well, they, you're, map, you're mapping anything, so that's the key type, and then to a corresponding value type, okay? So you would be mapping, let's say, an address to integers, right? And that's what they show you underneath here, actually. So mapping address, to integers. So each address will have its own specific unique uh, have its own specific unique value pair. okay? And then we actually see the example underneath here. So so let's say we're mapping six different things here. So we've got six keys. So key one goes to this index and it has five and that's going to be the first value. Key two goes to four, it has value two. Key three, goes to one, it has a uh, value three. Key four goes to three and has value four. And essentially this just creates a table so that we can keep track of each key. Once we have it mapped out, we can then access and do things to these keys consecutively, sequentially. We can store the information, we can retrieve the information. It essentially acts like a dictionary with index and value. 
okay? And again, and again, this is something we're going to do quite often. So, and so you can come back to this if you're confused whenever we're going through a mapping together. But this alone, it could be a little bit confusing. So it could still be confusing if you've never worked with mapping before. So no worries on that. Just keep this as your own footnotes so you can come back to this when you need it. But we're going to be doing plenty of examples together. So there are three type of variables when we think about the scope of the of our variables in solidity and what do i in solidity and what do i mean by variable scope i mean where what is the access level of our what is the access level of our variables so what do we so what do i mean by that well let's look at each type of variable and then under get a better understanding that way of how it's defined in terms of a scope so the first type of variable is a state variable so the first type of variable is a state variable okay so state variable are variables whose value are permanently stored in a contract storage. Okay. So all that really means is that a state variable is a variable that we declare that goes in the contract storage specifically. So a state variable variable are the variables that we can access throughout our functions and our contract. And we declare these variables and they're called state variables. So an example here is the stored data, right? Remember in our previous videos where we built our first smart contract, we made a store data variable and we set it to an integer, right? This is a state variable because we can then actually use this stored data, the stored data in different functions like our constructor, which is a special function, the constructor function that we will learn about later on. But as we can see, we can actually access our state valuable in our constructor function here by calling our stored data and setting it to a value of 10. Okay, so that is a state variable. Now, now local variables are the variables that we access within a function. All right, so let's scroll down here. So let's go into this function. So in this function, we see store data. Is this a local variable? Well, no, right? This variable is actually a state variable. This variable is actually a state variable, which we declare in our contract, right? Now, if we were to declare another variable in this function, for example, if we were to say, for example, if we were to say, um, multiplier, and we multiplier and we declare this as an integer and we set it to let's say 5 and then in our store data we did x times multiplier effectively we have created a new variable but this variable it, multiplier or you know what let's call it multiplier by five to be more specific, okay? But this variable essentially can only be accessed within this function, right? The rest of our contract is going to remain unaware of our local variable here, as long as it remains in the scope of this, because it remains in the scope of this function. So whereas our stored data, the state that variable can be accessed throughout our entire contract, as we can see here, our multiplier by five can only be accessed within this function. Now, if that's a little bit confusing still, the key takeaway here is that it's this is very important when it comes to actually defining and writing out our code so that we can, because otherwise, multiplier by five, if it were, if it were to be accessible everywhere, it could really mess up our code. The more coding you do, the more um, intuitive it becomes, let's say, because you're keeping track of your variables and how they're they're interacting. But when you're first starting out, I guess the most I guess the takeaway here is that this variable multiplier by five is only going to remain in this function, whereas our store data is going to be accessible throughout our entire contract. And multiplier by five is therefore a local variable. Okay, so global variables in Solidity essentially are these special variables that exist in the global namespace. 
okay? So we use these variables to get information specifically pertaining to the blockchain, okay? So let's take a look at some examples, examples of these special variables and what they return together. So, so some that are more, some that are probably more easily understandable. And gas left, let's say, gas left returns integer two five six. So this is a special global variable that actually is going to get for us the remaining amount of gas. Okay. MSG dot data gives completes a MSG dot sender address payable which we're going to use quite often in our DAP applications is act calls the sender of the message the current caller of the contract which is really important when we want that to be the owner let's say when we want that to be the owner let's say for example or the person who is using it message dot value on the other hand bring returns to us the number of the, the value that is sent with the message. And we have to remember that that number is the smallest value of ether in way. So we are gonna be using this as well, and we're gonna be looking at converting it to ether, right? And we see we have other ones. So feel free to go on your own and to look more into what all of these global variables do if you're interested in learning more about what each one does. We're gonna be using several of them in our contract. Now you're not going to use all of these in every contract that you write, but being interested and learning more about them gives you a better understanding of how Solidity works. So I encourage that as long as you don't spend all of your time on this, but just some time getting familiar with it. So these are the global variables. Modifiers allow us to control or modify the behavior of a function. So we can use modifiers in many different scenarios. So let's take a look at the example over here. So over here we see we have a contract called test. Now test takes the variable test address. We set that to an address. We set that to the type of being ad an address. We create a constructor. And in our constructor, we want our test address to equal the person who is the person who is calling the contract. That's the message dot sender. Now we can actually add a modifier to our construction, our constructor function. And this modifier can ensure that the person who actually are, can require that only the person, that only the owner can run, only the owner can do the following if the message.sender is equal to the test address. And if that is true, then we use this under case to continue moving along with the function Otherwise, we cancel the operation. So this is a requirement modifier. And we're going to actually be writing the we're going to be writing several of these out throughout the course. So you're going to get the hang of it to practice with this and do some exercises. But essentially, now that we have the modifier function, we can actually run this function test, right? Which is we can run, we can create a function called test, and we can ensure that test works, and we can modify this function test by including our modifier, only owner. So function test will work only if the message sender is equal to the test, is sender is equal to the test address. Now, if this doesn't make sense, again, don't worry. We're actually coming up in a couple videos, we're gonna be writing modifiers together, so it'll become more clear as we write them out. So constructors are a special function that we declare. And we do that by using the keyword constructor. This actually has a spelling typo. It says constructor, it should be constructor, okay? And that's executed only when the, and the constructor is, and the constructor function is executed only when the, upon the contract creation in Solidity. So we can either make constructors public or private, right? So we can, they can be accessible outside or not. If there isn't any constructor in the contract, then the contract will assume then the contract will assume that the contract itself is the default constructor. Okay, so here we see a contract solidity test for storing data. We have a constructor store data equals ten, and that's an example of the syntax and syntax. And so constructors we're going to use them quite often in our smart contracts, and we also use constructors for different reasons 
in JavaScript and in React in building our front end for our DAP applications once we actually leave the IDE and start working in our text editors uh, later on in the course. And we're going to go through constructors in that context as well, which is different than how we want to look at it with Solidity. All right. Okay, so let's talk about blockchain transactions. So in effect, a blockchain is this database, but it is globally shared, right? It is a decentralized database. It doesn't have one main point, but it you have multiple nodes, multiple computers that are bringing on the transactions towards the database. So this means that everyone can read the entries in the database just by participating in the network. All right, so what does that really mean? Well, if you want to change something in the database, then what you have to do is create transactions. And these transactions have to be accepted by everybody participating, okay? So the word, therefore, transaction implies that you change, that it implies that the change you want to make, uh, and you can assume you want to change, let's say, two things at the same time, it's either not done at all, or it's completely applied, okay? So let's take a look at an example together in case this isn't making that much sense yet. Don't worry about it. We're going to be running tons of actual transactions up onto some test networks together, and we're going to be running multiple smart contracts and doing all sorts of transactions, even interacting between the smart contracts together that we're going to build from scratch. And it'll make more sense the more we do it. But for now, just imagine a table. Okay, that lists the balances of all accounts in an electronic currency. Okay, so if a transfer from one account to another is requested, the nature of the database ensures that the amount, if the amount is subtracted from one account, then it's always going to be added to the other account. All right, it sounds basic, but this protocol, this system is actually. It's, it's genius, it's brilliant, and this is the fundamental to the applications to the decentralized system that we're looking at developing. So if due to whatever reason, adding the amount to the target account is not possible, then the source account will just not be modified. And we maintain the integrity of the blockchain that way. So also to note, a transaction is cryptographically signed by the sender, so by the person or the creator, all right? And this really just makes it much more straightforward to guard access to those specific modifications that we want to make. So a simple check can ensure that the person holding the keys to the, to the account can actually transfer money from it. And in that sense, we can look at the blockchain as a public ledger that is keeping track of all of the transactions. All right, so hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Again, we're just talking in terms of what these things mean in an abstraction, but we're concretely going to be coding along together and providing a lot of exercises and examples. So this will become something that you can really sink your teeth into in the course as we continue to progress.